What's going on? 2021, number five regular season. Again, crazy names with these IQ. But the main question is this Rory McDonald Gleison Tebow fight. And was it a fix? Now, to call something a fix is a huge allegation. So you better go look at the research, look at the fight, look at pretty much all the aspects that revolve around it and come up with an opinion. So I'm just going to present some of the facts, some of the notable little interesting points that happen along the course of the night and ultimately leave it up to you. I know that there's some hot opinions either side. Some people are calling it an outright fix. Some people are calling it just a very bad decision. Some people saying worst decision of the year or if not the worst they've ever seen. If that's a little bit harsh, who knows? If you do believe it, if that's the team that you're uh, you're representing, let's dive into some of the points. So first and foremost, we got to talk about the fight itself. The fight itself, not a fix. Now here's the thing, the misconception about a worked fight. A worked fight generally in the, the, the minds of people is like pro wrestling, right? Both guys are in on it. There's a set outcome. Either guy is in realization of it and they go out and they try to, you know, put on a show, dramatize a fight. That doesn't usually work. They tried to do it in Pancras. They tried to do it in some pride fights back in the day. There's been a few select fights along the course of MMA's history that have been both competitors are in on the work. It just doesn't work out. When you know that it's a fake fight, you don't fight realistically. And that almost never works out. It's the same way when you watch a movie or it's choreographed or you watch Kingdom, which is a great MMA show. Uh, the fights never really look legit because at the end of the day, they're staged. So the easiest way to work a fight is one guy is in on it, one guy is not. That guy usually takes the dive. He goes out there, he feels a little lethargic, he doesn't throw as many punches as he used to, but you don't work it taking that damage. That damage is long-term, a short-term benefit. So it's going to it's gonna be either a quick submission, a pap, that is something we've also seen in the course of MMA history on some of uh, the suspicious fights, is just a, a quick submission before the fight really gets going, and uh, of course, a bad decision. Now, when I look at this fight, neither guy is in on it. Gleison Tebow does not know that anything's going on. Rory McDonald does not know anything is going on. Both guys show up to fight. In Gleison's case, he realizes he probably needs a finish so that he can get into the PFL tournament or the finals playoff format, potentially win a million dollars. For Rory, he's more or less already guaranteed a spot in the finals, but he's on a winning streak. He wants to collect his show money and his win money. He doesn't want to lose to a guy like Gleison Tebow, which would certainly ruin some of the momentum he's building up. And also, it's just a bad look. I mean, Gleison is a shot UFC veteran at the tail end of his career. And Roy McDonald's a guy that left on his own free will, went and won a Bellator title, and now figures to be the favorite in a million-dollar tournament. He's got everything to win. He's got everything to lose. Gleison, meanwhile, he's fighting for his career. He's fighting for his fight. He's going to be dangerous. The way the fight plays out, first round, Rory goes out there, he's landing the jabs, he's landing the kicks, he's got the better volume. Gleison Tebow does rush him with a good 3-4 punch combination, most of which glance, a few of do which get through, and it looks appealing to the judges. At this point in the round, two of said judges have made up their mind, this is a Gleison Tebow round. Now Rory proceeds to press forward, hits Gleison, ends up taking his back, both hooks in, and fishes for the rear naked choke. It was a round that he was already winning, but to secure a back take, to fish for a rear naked choke is all points. Now, the choke never comes under the chin. However, the commentators are gushing over the fact that if tight neck crank, you can finish from this position, this is dangerous, and the row ends. If that's not a roaring McDonald round, then I, I don't know what is. But this is where the work comes into play. Gleison, Rory, not realizing anything's going on. The two of these judges who give Gleison Tebow the round, they know what's going on. Now, if you're going to work a fight on a judging standpoint, you're taking the risk that this fight needs to go decision. If Rory does finish that choke, there goes the work. If Rory is able to knock out Gleison Tebow, there goes the work. But it's a calculated gamble in that Gleison Tebow is fucking durable. This is a guy that's fought the who's who's best guys in the sport, arguably beat Khabib Nurmagomedov once upon a time, and is very durable. Has he been knocked out? Sure. Has he been submitted? Good luck doing that, but all the same. Could you finish him? Yes. But the percentage remains low. So banking him that first round is ultra important. If they all universally give Rory the first round, Gleison's now got his back against the wall. He needs to win the next two. But in giving him the first round, now he only needs to keep one of the next two rounds competitive. He could get blown out in the third round. He could get blown out in the second round. It doesn't matter. One of those two rounds, he can get killed. They will not score to 10-8 because it works it. So he just needs to keep one of the next two competitive. The second round is competitive. However, those same two judges give Rory McDonald around. Why do that? If it was a work, why not just give Gleison? Because now it's really starting to reek. You can't have Gleison Tivo up two rounds going into third in a fight that Rory McDonald is clearly winning. So you need to have this thing 1 1 going in, into the last round. And Gleison just needs to keep it close, which he does. 
So if you were a glycine better, and I know there was some out there, congratulations on the Kit Cash. Uh, the line was definitely off. You might have had a little bit from the judges, but regardless, it's nothing that glycine did wrong. There is a small argument, but you could argue it, that glycine did win that fight, that he did slim up rounds two and three, that he did land, albeit not the more shots, but potentially the better shots, if that's your argument. But there's really no argument that he won that first round. They're admitting that. So when you see this state apart in it, why? What, what does anybody stand to benefit from working this fight? It makes no sense. So the likely culprit when a fight gets worked is the line movement, right? Somebody's cashing a ticket on this and it stands to make a lot of money. Now, in this fight in particular, there is some somewhat suspicious line movement in it. Rory opens up as a 6-1 to favorite, minus 600, rightfully so. Almost immediately, the Rory line drops from minus 600 to minus 1,000. Not rightfully so, but it's just a testament that everybody's on Rory. They're backing Rory. They think he's going to win the fight. The money's going on. PFL's a bit of a soft opener, so if you hit it with a few... Somewhere along the line, the line jumps. It jumps back up briefly. Money comes in on Tebow before dropping exponentially back to Rory. Now, if you go to best fight odds, you'd have to put in Rory McDonald, best fight odds. You can see all the fights he's had, all the lines that, if it was a bettable fight, they've got a, a history of all the lines there. So you'll see this guy's in T-Bet last one out. Now, it's the most suspicious of all of Rory's fights right off the get-go. Because the one thing that stands out, he opens as a minus 600, but the closing line was minus 2,500, 25 to one favorite. Only that line never existed. Where, where did the minus 25, where did the 25 to one line appear from? Because the line closes at nine to one officially. And yet that lingering 25 to 2,500 still sitting there. And so what that creates is there was a select few people that were able to bet this plus 950 ticket on Glycine t -Bow. So everybody at home is raving and wrong that they got a plus 400, they got a plus 500. Some people are tweeting me, they got a plus 650 on Glycine t -Bow. Crazy. But a select few people hit that line at the proper time as it bounced and got a plus 950 ticket on Glycine t -Bow before readjusting the line. So those people stood to make the most. And those people were extremely sharp to the situation. But there's something beyond that, right? Was it just was it just money? Did somebody just look to fix the fight from a financial standpoint? Potentially, but not from a gambling standpoint necessarily. You got to look at this PFL standings. So the way it works is only the four guys from the regular season were going to make it into the playoffs. Rory is the number one seeded guy. He's the favorite to win the entire tournament. If he wins Glyson Tebow, if he wins his Tebow fight, which he should have, he's the number one seeded guy in the tournament. One faces four, two faces three. No big deal. Here's where the big deal comes into place. Magomed Magomed Karimov was the original favorite to win the tournament. He was supposed to win a million dollars last year, but pulled out of, uh, after he fought Chris Curtis in the first round, he pulled out of a fight versus Ray Cooper, I believe, in the in the semifinals, and as such, gets eliminated from the tournament. He's a scary Russian. He's got a nasty 28 and five record. He looks like he did over a million dollars last year. He stands to make a million dollars this year. Only guy standing in his way, Roy McDonald. So it's imperative that he does not meet Roy McDonald at any point on his way to the finals to hopefully get that million dollars. Now, why is Magomed Karimov so important? Because Magomed Karimov is ma managed by Dominance MMA, Ali Abdelaziz. Now, when you look at the other guys that are managed, tons of, pretty much everybody managed. Them. But just on the PFL rankings, right? Magomed Karimov is, is with Dominance and Ali. Emiliano Sordi, who won a million dollars last year. Lance Palmer, who won a million dollars last year. And we want going through. The first round of the tournament, they give him a soft matchup. He pulls out. Why does he pull out? Undisclosed. Now it's round two. Now it's do or die. You not only need to fight in this round two to have any type of chance to make it to the playoffs, but you would need a finish. And so who's somebody that they could give Magomed Karimov that he would almost be guaranteed to finish early and get enough points that everybody else fought twice? If you're only going to fight once, you need to get a quick finish to get in the playoffs. So in a bit of perfect matchmaking, they give him Curtis Millinder. Now, Millinder has no takedown defense. So right away, Magomed Karimov is going to be a, a huge problem to him. His submission defense, wonky. Magomed Karimov is going to be a huge problem to him. Likelihood of getting a first round finish is certainly there. And with Millinder, he just got subbed by Rory. No disrespect to Rory. Rory's not really a big finisher, you know, he, he's more of a go through the motion, pick you off with a jab, you know, stand at bay a little bit, uh, make frustrate you all night, but really not huge on knockouts or submissions for that matter. And so Curtis Millinder should be easy money for a guy like Magomed Karamov. 
Now, when you see the fight play out, fight starts, Magomed Karamov is not his usual self. He's not pressing forward. He's tentative. He's standing on the back. He gets kicked once in the leg, and he buckles from it. And now it comes to my realization, this is why he pulled out of that first round five weeks ago. He's got a knee injury. And they've put him in the second round against the most winnable guy here so he could theoretically get the win, get the layoff until the playoffs start, and then become a factor again. So one, the matchmaking standpoint, they give it to Magma Karamov to ensure that he gets in. But now here's the issue we're going to run into. With the singular win, even with the maximum six points, he's still going to be the number four guy. And if he's the number four guy, he's going to have to fight Rory McDonald in the first round, who's the, realistically the other tournament favorite. That's bad for business. That's bad for business because that makes the other round, Joe Zeferino versus Ray Cooper. And Zeferino is managed by Dominic MMA, by the way. But now you've got a shot of getting your guys to the final, right? Whereas if they're both fighting a guy not managed by you, both your guys lose, there's nothing. You're ensuring here 100% that one of these guys probably is able to make it to the million dollar spot. So I almost feel like in giving Glyson, Glyson didn't stand to make the playoffs with a victory over Rory McDonald. Again, he's managed by Ali. Maybe he got the rub in that regard, but it, it wasn't like that. It was, it was more so Glyson went out there. He gave a respectable account of himself. We need the judges to score it the other way so that Rory falls into the number two spot. And now Magomed Karamov fights Joao Zeferino in the first round. Well, now we've got a guaranteed one of our guys is going to the finals. Likely Magomed Karamov. If Rory beats Ray Cooper, which would be a tough fight, to be honest with you. But regardless, whoever wins that, Magomed Karamov presents a nice threat to that guy. Now, does he have an injury to his knee? Potentially. Yeah, I would think so. But now that they've set him up to have a little bit of recovery time, an easier path to the finals... It's all it's almost just lined up. So did people cash tickets on it? Yes, but from a financial standpoint for the organization and the fact that like 75% of the roster is managed by the same company, like that all to me just kind of huge allegation. And I, I don't I'm I don't want to take any heat from this video from people being like, oh shit, he just called it a fix and he called it Ali. I, I'm I'm not. I'm just presenting interesting information that I thought to be handy. So I guess the only thing we can look at is the scorecards. Uh, Cardio Urso and Dave Torelli are both the ones that give the first round uh, for Gleison Tebow. Eric Cologne is not in on this. He doesn't know anything's going on, so he scores it for Rory. The second round, they all give it to Rory. The third round, they all give it to Tebow. In Colin's case, he knows when he puts down that 10-9 for Gleison, he knows the fight's already for Rory. So it might be a pity card, whereas the other guy knows that it's absolutely imperative to score that third round for Gleison Tebow. And as such, the fight metric numbers mean nothing. The fan vote meant nothing. Both commentators, Sean and Randy Couture, it means nothing. It's the two guys sitting there, zero accountability to them who make the ultimate decision. And whereas no one's going to really care about this is, well, Rory still went into the playoffs. And I mean, Clyson kind of did good. And ignore the fact that they scored the first round for him. Ignore that. Rory's still going to go to the finals. And it's just a bump in the road, just a bad decision. But it's like, I don't know. Maybe there's something behind the scenes. So anyways, leave your comments in the comment section. Shoot me up on Twitter. Don't shoot me up on Twitter. Hit me up on Twitter gently. And uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, it, it's your call. It was stinky business as far as I'm concerned. It screwed up the parlays. But such is the sport. Good bounces, bad bounces. We've gotten good bounces. We've gotten some bad bounces. You can't dwell on it. You got to move on to the next card. And uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. So looking forward to the upcoming UFC. Until then. Take it easy.